on BYUSN. Would a men's hoops win over Baylor tonight? Make up for the loss to Cincinnati? Big game in Waco. We'll visit with Jeff Hansen of 24-7 Sports about the impact of signing four-star safety Falatau Satuala and BYU's recruiting ranking of seventh best in the Big 12. Takes one to know one. Former BYU star Austin Colley is here to talk about Puka Nakua's incredible rookie season. We'll also look at how his record-breaking year stacks up against all the former Cougars who've enjoyed time in the NFL. Hey, playoffs this weekend. Let's go. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Tuesday, January 9th. I am Jerem Jordan. He is hoping to uh, cope with the end of the college football season. Dave McCann. You know, I don't love this day. I, I, I don't <laughs> love when it's over. I know. Because we, we enjoy Sorry. the game so much, even though it's the busiest, most stressful time of year, from when we start our pregame stuff to, to the very last game. Uh, but it's such an awesome time of year. And maybe the reason it's so great is because now there's this long layoff mm -hmm. until it comes back. I the NFL's found a way to stretch it to yes. half the year. Which is, uh, now we can focus on the NFL yeah, playoffs for the next. But month. there's something magical about college, and I yeah. think it's the, the separation. Uh, and then once August comes around, we don't care that it's 100 degrees. It's just We're ready. all ready to go. In fact, so if they started college football a little earlier, now that the playoffs going to bleed into like the middle of January, I'd be fine. Like if the yeah. first game was the last week of August, fantastic. I love that the Cougars are playing August 31st because it go. does make it seem like it's like it's closer. How many days? Da, 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 da. I, I don't know how many ways, but <laughs> we haven't done the away, countdown 200 yet. something rather. Last night, Boney Fuller, who is back apparently, um, I loved this tweet. This made me chuckle. Washington finally learning that beating Michigan for a national title is harder than they thought. Great <laughs> reference to 1984. Washington finished second in the country at 11 and one, beat Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. They felt like they should win the national title right. in '84. If you had beaten said Michigan, Jim Harbaugh, by the by the way, was on that Michigan squad. Yeah, broken arm. They were as high as number three earlier in the season. He's sitting on the sideline. He's sitting on the sideline. Sometimes that happens. He had a great view of last night's national title <laughs> and BYU's national title. Yeah, poor Washington. <laughs> Well, now they're in the Big Ten. And then there was, so, there's always Cougar fans at all these things. And, and one of the great things about Cougar Nation is they represent. Absolutely. Whether it's Disneyland, the, the mall, or the national championship game. And here's Ryan sporting the, the Royals Rappin'. right down there in the good seats. Rapping. Let's go. I love that. That's awesome. By the way, there was a rumor report that a college football 2024 EA Sports game was going to have a commercial in the broadcast. And so there were people that never saw it and were like, Yo, what happened? <laughs> they were bummed. I am excited about that game at some point, though. Coming out, oh, it's supposed to be next year. Been gone for a long time. That'll be fun. Yeah. Fun fact, Brian Logan was on the back of the 2009 cover. Not the front, the back. <laughs> but he was on he, it. He's on a cover. And I think uh, someone from Oklahoma is making a catch or something. So, oh, yeah. So you can ask Brian about it. Might that. have been a, a defensive pass interference. <laughs> Perhaps at the goal line. They did get a goal line uh, stop there, though, which is pretty good. Okay, all rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. <laughs> now another one stolen away by baker around the back twice hands it to johnson Atiki throws it down atiki alley-oop atiki what's trending is presented by bioi food to go the mvp of your next event tonight the only game in america tonight between two ranked teams is byu at number 18 baylor at number 14 First ranked matchup of the Big 12 season. It's exciting. Cougars looking to rebound Dave from a loss Saturday to Cincinnati. So, would a win tonight over Baylor on the road make up for the Cincinnati loss? Absolutely, it would. And, and because you lost at home, you got to go find one on the road. So, first and foremost, it would it would accomplish that. You, you get one back that that folks probably didn't think you were able to win. Now they could also get one at UCF on Saturday in a in a matchup that might be is that expected more conducive. Yeah, uh, they're they're picked 14th. BYU was picked 13th. Yeah. So just on those numbers alone, you think that one. But tonight uh, with Baylor and Baylor's tough and BYU struggled on the road the last little bit. Uh, just one true road game this year, but you dive into last season, they lost their last five, so yeah. last six. Uh, did okay in Vegas, won that, but then on a neutral site, uh, away from the Marriott Center, but, but now they're into the hostile stuff, and it's going to be really, really interesting. The thing that I like about BYU's chances tonight is the numbers are supporting this team as being good. Uh, it's not just the goggles of, of hey, they're, in the, they're 98 in the net, we're trying to convince you that they're 20th. This is, oh, this is the, these are the numbers, right? <laughs> and uh, they, they go in, they're still the number one three-point shooting team. 
They still top Baylor in rebound margin. They're still the number one assist to turnover uh, team in the country. They're still in the top five in bench scoring. All of those things that quantify a decent yep. team, yep. they're still that. And was, was Saturday just kind of a bad night? Or does that team with those numbers go into a road venue and surprise Baylor, who fully expects to win? I uh, completely agree. It would absolutely make up for the Cincinnati loss. Does BYU need to win tonight? No. BYU needs to play well, though. No. We need to see an improved team. We cannot see anything remotely close to what we saw Saturday, or it's going to start to get weird. But you have to win at UCF regardless of what happens tonight, by the way. You've got to walk out of the first three with at least that one win. If you can get one tonight, you certainly feel differently about things. Because guess what? Through the first three games, we were hoping for 2-1 and one anyway. This is an expected loss. In fact, let's look at some of the numbers. Baylor uh, out of Vegas, 3.5-point favorite. Ken Palm, 44% chance to win for BYU. One-point game, according to Ken Palm. ESPN matchup predictor, 33% BYU. So, BYU's not supposed to win this game. It's in the new sparkling, and there's some great numbers, right? New sparkling $212 million Foster Pavilion. And uh, it's the first Big 12 game in there. Second game total uh, ever, right? Um, the Baylor beat Cornell. Uh, ever heard of them? And uh, here we are. So, this is th now watching Baylor on Saturday against Oklahoma State. They went on the road. They, they won in overtime. There are some athletes. There's a lot of length. It's the number one three-point shooting team by percentage. They only made two threes on Saturday, by the way. Yeah. Did not make a lot of threes. shoot a lot. They rebound really well, though. Hit the gla offensive glass uh, hard, 16-5 to five advantage there. That's a place where BYU needs to show up. BYU was the number one rebounding margin team walking into Saturday, and they got – kind of worked on the boards. If BYU can win or barely lose that battle, they're in the game tonight because I don't expect the three-point shooting to be as bad as it was Saturday. But BYU can go in and they can win this game. There's some NBA. Jacoby Walter is the best freshman in the league. He leads Baylor in scoring. Ray J. Dennis, familiar name. He played at Boise State when they beat BYU a couple years ago, went to Toledo. Now he's at Baylor. You'll see the ball in his hands a lot. BYU needs a win against, uh, against Scott Drew and Baylor, by the way. Scott Drew 3-0. They met, obviously, in the Marriott Center back in 2011. They met in the NIT in uh, 2013 in the semifinals. But this is a game that BYU has a better chance in than you think. I, I think if the regular BYU that we've seen, and I'm not talking the one that, like, makes 15 threes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking they make 11 threes, but they rebound well and they defend well and they get to the free throw line a little more and make that. BYU can absolutely be in this game and or win it tonight. I could also see what happened Saturday happen again because of length and better defense, but I don't anticipate BYU to shoot the three as poorly as they did Saturday. Baylor's not as deep as uh, Cincinnati, where Cincinnati was just rolling in tall guys. And, uh, and Baylor, I think, played seven guys against Oklahoma State. And, and Caleb Lohner, not very much, played a couple of minutes yeah. all game. The former BYU Cougar. See him tonight again. But Baylor is 77th in the country in defending the three. Mm. And BYU is number one in the country in shooting the three. So like to, making and taking. Yeah, to yep. win the game tonight, yep. it's the three-point line. Yep. Uh, Foose is still coming on. He's not at full speed. It'll be a couple weeks. It's uh, mano a mano down there, advantage just about every team in the league. Yep. Out on the arc where you can line up four or five different guys, um, that's where you can go on the road and steal one. That's where you can win tonight. And you're playing a team that, that hey, we got to defend the three tonight. we got to defend the three tonight. got to be in the face of Jackson Robinson, all those guys. But they're 77th in the country and actually going out there and doing it. So there's the, there's the window in, I think, tonight. Can BYU create better three-point opportunities? Some of those were forced, not only forced by the score in the game. Hey, we've got to make a play. We've got to make a shot right now. But can BYU get to the rim and create a two-on-one where they find that open shooter and they take open threes? Like, Trevin, well, any Trevin Nell three was a good three uh, on Saturday, even if it was forced. Um, but even that, hand in his face, that's a tougher three. That's a wide open three. There are different kinds of three-pointers, by the way. But can BYU match the length and physicality of Baylor? Uh, Eve Misi is a good rebounder, one of the best shot blockers in the country, uh, third in the Big 12. He's a presence on the inside that BYU's sure. got to deal with. Can Ali Khalifa continue to do his thing? He equaled his turnover yeah. account on Saturday, and we were like, Wow! He still had six assists. He still was, number one in the country. He's still number one in the country. <laughs> but it is, it is a matchup that BYU, who is top 20 in all the metrics that matter in terms of offensive and defensive efficiency, points per possession, and allowed, 
Baylor is 94th in points allowed per possession, uh, 70th in defensive efficiency. Can BYU's offense, which has proven that it's really good, uh, play against Big 12 competition, and now it's a step up in Big 12 competition, of course. Baylor, it goes Kansas, then Baylor in the pecking order of quality in the Big 12 the last several years. BYU can, can uh, challenge Baylor, though. 62-6 and six at home in the last five, 11-3 and three against ranked teams. They win, and they win at home. But even to Baylor, it feels a little new in that gym because sure. it's a brand-new gym. I'm willing to go out on a limb here and say that if BYU has a player who's made nine three-pointers, He's staying in the game tonight. <laughs> he won't sit for 550 consecutively. Out. No, he is going to stay in. Even if he's exhausted, he's staying in the game. And Jim Fredette made a great point uh, yesterday. Uh, if if Trevin Nell sits for that long, why not get a Jackson Robinson going a little more, right? Um, which Jackson is still kind of coming off that ankle a little bit and, and hasn't he, looked he the same quite as. Right. Yeah. So, like, and, and what's, uh, you know, Dawson Baker, how's that foot? Because he's a guy who can create off the dribble get to the free throw line. Uh, he was top 200 in the country in drawing fouls last year. So we'll see what version of BYU shows up tonight. But it, I want to see a better version of BYU compete better. I, I would tolerate a loss on a, the road against a ranked team if you play well. If you, get, if you get blown out, though, there could be some massive issues discussed tomorrow. Do what you do. You get off to a decent start, yep. take care of the ball, pass up good shots Rebound. for better shots, and you got to hit your shots. You're all good shooters. you got to... You gotta hit the shots. It's still th- 10 feet. I think we can stare at the rebounding margin and know what happened tonight. Yeah. Not just threes. I think threes are obvious. I think less obvious is rebounding. Yeah. So when, we'll see. Hey, when you're missing, uh, what did they miss? Uh, they were four of 31 from three, not named Trevin. Yeah. Now. Those are a lot of rebounds. And Trevin Those missed shots five, go in. So, Cincinnati yeah. doesn't get those rebounds. Yep. But there are balls bouncing all over the place. Yep. All right, our, se- our second topic today about Puka Nakua. We've been thinking about that, as has everybody. Hopefully the voters of the uh, Rookie of the Year are thinking about it. Come on now. Uh, But did Puka just have the best NFL season ever from a former BYU player, not named Steve Young, who was MVP? I think among skill position players that are easier to quantify quality, like defense, you can't just look at tackles, right? You've got to look at a lot of other stuff. And, and, uh, you know, there have been other linemen who had tremendous, tremendous seasons in the NFL. Just looking, just thinking about skill positions. I think so. Like Steve Young had the top X, what you know, top five seasons of anybody in, right. in the NFL. He was unbelievable. The only Pro Football Hall of Famer. Austin Collie was really good, right? He had three years of 70 or more catches, 500 plus yards, but he never had a season like this. Right. Like his, his he wasn't season. used like this. His rookie season was great. He had 60 catches and seven touchdowns. He was awesome. Who had 105? Yeah. And Austin had more Austin touchdowns had 600 than Puka. and something yards. Puka had 1,400 and something. And it's Crazy. It's, it's 2023, and uh, Cooper Cup was hurt for a bit. Yeah. And that was the opportunity that Puka needed because they were like, whoa, we can throw the same amount of targets to this guy and get similar production. So the fact that Puka goes ninth in catches in the league, fourth in yards, and fifth in first down catches, by the way, let alone breaks the rookie record. I think so, Dave. I think we saw uh, through the regular season – the best season by any BYU Cougar in the NFL ever, any position, not named, Steve Young. It was incredible. You know, what, what else made him great was the side stories and his post-game interviews. And, and his, his hair. His, his, his hair, his, <laughs> his, 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 uh, his relationship with his mom. Yeah. Everything about Puka Nakua uh, this season in the NFL, uh, on the field and off the field, has been such a giant positive for the Nakua family, for the Rams, and for BYU. And uh, you, you can't buy that kind of PR. You can't go out and order it. It just gets created. And every Sunday, or at least almost every Sunday, he was doing something. And then when he's doing interviews, there's this boyish honesty that comes from him that, uh, that, that just brings you in. Now, we know him, so we're brought in that way. But almost like a Taysom Hill with... With so many people around the NFL who've come to know this guy, Puka's done it in one season, um, but he's just so endearing uh, as he's done it, and I think that's what has made him so popular. That's why 17 jerseys are all over the place. Yeah, and, and the fact that, you know, Otani shows up and he's yeah. wearing 17, right? Like, he's wearing 17 because it's 17, but uh, he's also wearing 17 because, uh, you know, a little Puka Nakua there. Sure, we'd, why not? We'd like to think that. Um, what, what a story. And there have been some great seasons. I could see the argument for any of the previous two All-Pro seasons from Fred Warner, who is pacing for a Hall of Fame career. Sure. Todd Christensen had some um, unbelievable years where he led the NFL in receiving um, 
you could argue for that. Ziggy Ansah uh, being a all-pro player, 14 and a half sacks in the game. I, Jim McMahon, the right. quarterback of a Super Bowl winning team, right? Granted, a lot of handoffs to Walter Payton that year. They didn't still. ask him to throw. But you're still the quarterback He's of a, a Super Bowl Chicago winning team. Of that, yeah. Dennis Pitta helped uh, you know, the Ravens win a Super Bowl. And, and 2016 for Dennis was his best year. But he, no, we don't have time for him on the show today. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, what we've seen from Puka uh, has been nothing short of incredible. But will he win the rookie of the year? Like, what, why wouldn't he? Because C.J. Stroud certainly feels like the, the other competitor there. Quarterbacks seem to get the the attention, the yeah. upper hand. If you listen to the NFL commentators over the last couple of weeks, it's all been, well, and Stroud making a case for that rookie of the year because he got his team in the playoffs, mm-hmm. the Texans. Yep. Um, I, I, he's probably going to get it, but but Puka has a case uh, of, of, of that he should get it. I, yeah, I could see the argument for, uh, of course, Stroud, but hey, Puka's our guy. Puka's we, our we're guy. a little biased on this one. <laughs> our question of the day, back to men's hoops. Would BYU men's hoops beating Baylor tonight make up for the Cincinnati loss? Brian on X. You can weigh in on X, Facebook, and Instagram. I don't know that it would, that it would make up for it, but Saturday was an expected win. Today is an expected loss. Uh, coming out of the first two with a 1-1 one one record puts you on track for a 9-9 or 10-8 finish, which is the goal. Brian, I think it absolutely makes up for it because what, 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 is, what, what gets you more value? Um, uh, the, the, the home loss uh, what, what's, what, is that as bad as it is good? No. This would be a ranked win on the road. Quad one win. On against the, road. the team. That, yes, it's a quad one. Uh, there are going to be a lot of those. This is a team that won the national title two, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Like, this well-respected program. I, uh, I feel like it absolutely would. I think you do, too. Continue to weigh in. I, lo- I want to hear from people that don't think it is. Like, Brian, let's go. All right, it is Showdown Tuesday here in Waco, or over there in Waco, Texas. Number 18, BYU. Number 14, Baylor. Cougars looking to steal one on the road. Greg Rubel, Mark Durant, Ben Bagley. Our live coverage starts at 8 Eastern on BYU Radio. Jeff Hansen of 24-7 Sports tells us next about four-star safety Falatau Satuala and where BYU might need to hit the transfer portal for next season. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. The 10 to 5, LJ with the TD. And he's going down for the first time tonight, Tyler Batty. Retzloff, Roberts, touchdown Cougars. It is picked off of the 40, touchdown Jacob Robinson. We are live in Studio B on this Tuesday morning with the day-to-day Cougar Sports play-by-play. Dave McCann, I'm Jerem Jordan. We now bring in from 24-7 Sports, Jeff Hansen to talk all things recruiting and signees. Jeffrey, how we doing, man? Doing well. How are you guys this morning? We're doing good. We got a ranked matchup in basketball. We got football to talk about. So it is a good day for a daily sports show. Uh, Okay, Saturday, it was a big deal that BYU signed four-star safety Falatau Satuala. He announced on national TV, apparently this had been in the works because BYU had the graphic ready and whatnot. He had signed in the early period. What did his signing mean for BYU in this class, and what does he bring to the table? Man, it's huge. I mean, for for the class, it's kind of that gold star on top of the, the class so far, right? I mean, there's still some more additions, I think, that we'll see from the high school ranks and certainly from the transfer portal. But the class so far, Falitao, he really is that gold star. He's the cherry on top. It's a huge deal. Uh, I first saw Falitao play live. I think it was his playoff game, his junior season. They ended up losing to Orem. There were some really special players on the field at that time, guys who ended up at Oregon and some other big schools. And without a doubt, Falitao Satuala was the best athlete on the field that game. And when I watched him, it was like, whoa, that's a guy. He's a difference maker. He has a presence about him that reminds me of when I covered Puka Nakua at Orem High School. I mean, he just is that big time of a playmaker. And for now, all these years later, I think, you know, what has it been, 18 months since I saw that game, for BYU to sign Falitao Satuala, to add him to this mix of, of really talented players that Jay Hill's putting together on the defensive side of the ball, it's a huge deal. I mean, think of what Puka Nakua brought to BYU I think this is the defensive version of that type of impact mm. for BYU. And really, right away, I think he has the ability to impact the defense uh, almost immediately after he gets on campus. The Big 12 is now 16, so we already got a math issue right out of the gate. Uh, 
your service has BYU at the seventh best recruiting class, seven out of 16. Why so high? BYU's done really well with the high school players that they haven't got in the past. I mean, you look at guys like Satuala, you look at a Reiner Swanson, Danny Saili flipping from Texas Tech. BYU's done really well with the junior college and, and high school players. There's been, I, I think there's a couple of factors there that play into that. There's been a lot of attention nationally on the transfer portal. And if you look at what Jay Hill has done, he added a bunch of transfers last year as he kind of like mixed and matched and figured out what his roster needed to look like. But this, this recruiting cycle, it doesn't seem like he's as transfer portal heavy. Jack Kelly is still there. Uh, Mark Collins is committed. So there's still a couple of guys that have committed out of the portal, but he's getting guys that are coming from high school or coming from the junior college ranks that are going to stick around for a few years. And that seems like what, what, uh, what Jay wants to do. So while so much of the country is focused on the transfer portal, Jay Hill's kind of looking somewhere else and saying, hey, there's some junior college players that are going to make a big time impact for me in Provo. And nobody's really looking at them. It, it's kind of what Jay's always had to do, right? When he was at Weber State, he had to look where others weren't looking to get talent. He's got a knack for that. And I think he's done that again in this class for BYU. And that helps because when you're going toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with certain transfers, a lot of those guys want uh, money. And BYU, uh, while it's trying to get better in that space and, and has done fine, it might take a sec before BYU is one of the elite teams in terms of paying guys. It's not what BYU is about. They want a certain kind of guy, and it seems like they're doing better at getting that kind of guy. But back to sort of impact freshmen out of high school. Typically, you don't have too many that come in and play right away. You mentioned that Satuala could at safety, and certainly – you hope you don't have to go to the well like BYU did this last year. But we saw some freshmen playing this year. Who do you think is the most likely among the class to perhaps get some playing time, maybe starting, but probably not, in the two deep? Yeah, so for me, I look at I look at that impact freshman question. I always look at it kind of like I look at my fantasy football roster. Like, what makes a good fantasy football player? You've got to have opportunity as much as you have to have talent, right? I mean, you can be a really, really good running back, but if you're behind another really, really good running back, you're not going to play. So I look at, at what BYU's roster looks like going into next year. That safety position, there's going to be an opportunity for guys like Tommy Prassus and for Fale Tau Satuala to come in and earn early playing time. Now, that's not to say that BYU is completely devoid of talent or anything like that. Michael Harper's coming back, Raider DeMooney. I mean, there's, there's all those guys that played, Crew Wakely, Tanner Wall. They're all still there. But there wasn't anybody who was healthy enough for 12 games that you look at them and you have them immediately penciled in as an absolute starter, no questions asked. Micah Harper probably could be that guy, but he's coming off a major injury, so you don't really know if he's going to be able to play. Uh, Crew Wakely, had, you know, he was up and down throughout the year. Tanner Wall got hurt. Raider DeMooney, still young. There's going to be opportunities for Satuala and Prasis to earn early playing time. And I think that Tommy Prasis, especially – as a free safety where BYU has so many strong safeties in the room right now, I think that Tommy, he's going to have a chance to earn early reps. And then when Folly Tau gets here in the summer, he's just such a special athlete. It's going to be really hard for Jay Hill to keep him off the field. Now, what does he do physically? Uh, Folly Tau could end up moving up and playing linebacker. He could play any number of different positions, but I think his athleticism, Jay Hill's going to have a hard time keeping him on the sideline. Jeff Hansen, 24-7 Sports. All right, now let's talk about the question everyone wants answered. Uh, in the arms race with Utah, now that BYU and Utah are back in the same conference, and the Utes have had 13 years of recruiting to a P5, and BYU has had one. This recruiting class that you've ranked seventh in the Big 12, how does it stack up against the rivals to the north, and, uh, and, and how long will it take for BYU to catch, if not pass, in their overall recruiting efforts with Utah? Yeah, so Utah still, I mean, they don't have the quantity that BYU has right now in, in the class of 2024, uh, but they still probably have a higher quality player right now, uh, just broadly speaking across the board. So BYU still has work to do. There's, there's no sense in trying to hide behind that. What I think BYU learned this year is with a guy like Satuala, with uh, with Ephraim Asiata, some of these other players, uh, Kinilau Fonahema, that, that BYU was able to win the head-to-head -head battle against Utah. I think that this coaching staff gained some confidence. 
And I think that's the biggest thing that has been missing in the equation for, uh, of BYU versus Utah on the recruiting trail. Yes, BYU, you know, they haven't been power five and Utah has. Yes, Utah has more resources and all of those things. All of that is still true, but that's going to just naturally and organically even itself out. One, Utah, I think, has to adjust how they've done things. They're not going to be able to do things the exact same way in the Big 12. So they're learning and they're adjusting, and, and so is BYU. So I'm not worried about that aspect of it. The biggest gap is that when Kyle Whittingham and his coaching staff go and they sit into the house, into a, a living room with a recruit, they don't feel threatened by BYU, or at least they haven't over the course of the last decade and change. I think that changes with this class because BYU won some head-to-head -head battles, and this coaching staff, Kalani, Jay, I mean, really, Aaron Roderick, the entire staff knows that, hey, we don't have to be scared of Utah anymore. We can beat them head to head. And if they lose, there's still other talent that they can go and get. You heard Kalani talk about it a little bit on signing day, that they learned that hey, they don't have to shy away from the big boys. They found a pitch that works. And when they flip guys from, uh, you know, flip guys from Stanford or they flip guys from Texas Tech and they beat Utah head to head, that's a big deal that this this coaching staff needs confidence too. And I think this coaching staff got a whole lot of confidence that they can now parlay into a better class in the future. If you're scared by a dog, that's what uh, that's what I say. Okay, <laughs> where does BYU need to hit the portal ahead of next season? Yeah, I mean, quarterback is obvious. They, now they, they, they did pick up a commitment from Gary Bohannon. Uh, I, I like that commitment for BYU. Uh, I, I think that he brings something different than what Keaton Slovis brought last year, and it really is is, is mental. Uh, Keaton Slovis came in and was immediately the starting quarterback. Gary Bohannon's not going to immediately be named the starting quarterback. He's not going to be handed the job in the spring either. So I think throughout this offseason, Jake Retzlaff, guys in the room like, like uh, Ryder Burton, Cade Finnegan, and Gary Bohannon, they're going to have to compete. They're going to have to push each other to get better. And I don't see Aaron Roderick naming a starting quarterback probably until fall camp starts. I think that's good for the locker room. I think that that competition is going to be good for every quarterback on the roster. They still probably need an offensive lineman or two, and I could see BYU still looking. I mean, running back, I think, is obvious. And, and then maybe a defensive back or two. Gennaro likes to have that kind of depth at his cornerback position, and I think that BYU, even with the addition of Mark Collins, I think they could still potentially add one more cornerback uh, to give to Coach Guilford so that he could fill out his depth chart. Good stuff. Go check out uh, Jeff Hansen on 24-7 Sports covering the Cougs. We appreciate the time, Jeff. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. See ya. Jeff Hansen, 24-7 Sports. Always good stuff, man. A lot of storylines for spring ball now. You know, especially I, that quarterback. The best spot. thing for content creators like Jeff and us is a quarterback battle. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the best. Oh, well, we got one. <laughs> and we look forward to it in March. Tonight, or tomorrow night, BYU basketball with Mark Pope. He and a player guest will recap tonight's game against Baylor. And look ahead to UCF on Saturday afternoon. You can see it 8.30 Eastern again tomorrow night on the BYU TV app. You can also get tickets for the show at BYUSN.com. They're busy. They play the game. They fly back tonight. They'll be back for tomorrow. Why didn't they'll they just leave. go straight to Florida? They'll leave because they got the Pope Show, Dave. <laughs> Coming up, it's a ball night in Waco, an award for Luke Benson in volleyball. And how many way too early top 25 college football teams do we think BYU will beat next year? Have this is seen, BYU Sports Nation. Have you seen our forecast and Florida's forecast? <laughs> <laughs> I have. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media for content throughout the day on Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Welcome back to Studio B. I'm Jeremy. He's Dave. Here are today's headlines. Let's do it. Men's hoops fall six spots down to number 18 in the AP poll after the loss to Cincinnati. Cougars looking for their first Big 12 win in Waco tonight against 14th ranked Baylor. Pre-game coverage 8 Eastern on BYU Radio, followed by tip-off at 9 Eastern. Also, ESPN's Joe Lenardi has dropped BYU to a six seed in his latest bracketology, down from a three seed before the Bearcats game. Well, one game, three lines. Wow. wow. Luke Benson's the MPSF Offensive Player of the Week after totaling 23 kills, 7 digs, career high 4 aces in 2 matches against number 11 Ball State last week. BYU stayed number 9 in the ABCA poll. They play number 10th ranked, the Fighting Sister Jeans of Loyola Chicago, Thursday. Former BYU defensive backs D'Angelo Mandel and Caleb Hayes 
were both signed to futures contracts yesterday. Mandel signed with the Commanders, Hayes signed with the Giants. Uh, both players spent this past season on the practice squads with the teams that they signed with. We're proud of those guys, wish them the best. Women's volleyball setter signing in now in Rolly. Alex Bowers, the Idaho State uh, Gatorade Player of the Year in her four years of Skyview in Nampa. Bauer and her teammates won four state titles, did not lose to a team from Idaho. That's pretty good. Yeah. She's the younger sister of Whitney and Eden, daughter of former Cougars Caroline and Danny. And she's in school now uh, practicing with the team. Fantastic. And to wrap up headlines, let's look at the men's hoops games across the Big 12 tonight outside of BYU Baylor. We start with number two Houston at Iowa State. Houston coming off a big 34 point win against West Virginia. Houston 70% chance to win that. Top defensive team in the country by efficiency at the moment. Interesting game, Texas at Cincinnati. Somehow the Longhorns are still ranked coming off the loss to Texas Tech. Bearcats with that big win here in Provo. 65% chance to win according to Ken Palm for Cincinnati. That'd be quite so the start for the, the Bearcats. The pressure is them at home in front of fans, yeah. in front of a Big 12 night. Home games matter in the Big 12 quite a bit. Kansas State at West Virginia Wildcats, three point favorite from Ken Palm in Morgantown. West Virginia five and nine, only put up 55 points at Houston, but hey, Houston again is really good. Oklahoma State at Texas Tech. Cowboys lost to Baylor in overtime at home on Saturday. I mentioned the Red Raiders beat Texas in Austin, and now the Red Raiders are back in Lubbock, a 10-point favor, according to Ken Palm. Texas Tech will be in Provo in a couple of weeks. Those are today's headlines. Let's whip it now. We didn't Cougar. even mention where Pacific's playing. <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> we don't care. Uh, the Cougar Whip Round is presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Five Big 12 teams included in ESPN's way too early top 25 for college football. It's not way too early. It's perfectly season. timed, Dave. Arizona at 9, Utah 13, yep. Oak State 18, Kansas State 21, Kansas 23. BYU plays uh, all five of them, four at home. What's your early prediction for BYU in those matchups? Really hoping for two and three. I yeah. would take two and three. Now, here's the thing. One or two of those teams won't finish ranked. Maybe even three. Who knows? But they, like, Arizona deserves the love because they retain coach and quarterback. Yeah. And they looked good. And they looked good at the end of the year, um, especially when they did the haka Everybody uh, else at dinner to so Oklahoma. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Utah certainly expects to be good. Oklahoma State, Kansas State, Kansas State. That's interesting, right? It's going to be a new era of the Big 12. But uh, hopefully BYU plays well, surprises people. And they are a team that's ranked at some point. We'll yeah. see. Maybe we get that schedule next week. Let's hope. What do you think in the five games? I think about right. Two and three. Two and three. I'd like to go five and oh. Especially four at home. Four at home gives you a real chance. Two and three with one of those up in Salt Lake, that'd be all right. Yeah, that's right. Yesterday, New York Jets GM Joe Douglas spoke to the media to wrap up the season, was asked about Zach Wilson's future with the team. We're, we're, we're going to do what's right for the team, you know, and and so um, had a good good conversation with Zach, so we're going to get together after after these uh, player exit interviews and and get with the get with the staff and, and put our game plan together for the offseason. Are you open to trading it? Look, um, you guys know if, if, if the phone phone answers, I'm going to pick it up. Um, but, um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball into what what exactly is going to happen here in the future. Only in New York does the phone answer. The phone, the ceiling it's is the, the roof, the Jets, uh, okay. said Michael Jordan. Uh, uh, yeah, he's out of there. He's out. You and I have a better chance of playing for the Jets next year. I think, I think I, they're yeah. done with Zach and Zach's done with them. Your other employer, the Deseret News, uh, they were the first to report this. Right. That, that Zach would be traded after the season. This is this is great for Zach. I want Zach out of there. I didn't want him there in the beginning. So I'm stoked. It just needs to be a spot where uh, potentially he gets an opportunity and he's ready for said opportunity and he has a line uh, that can work with him and an experienced, you know, learn OC grow, and whatnot. Yeah. Get paid. Yeah. All that stuff. Please, almost anywhere else for Zach. <laughs> Joe Lenardi, we mentioned a moment ago, has BYU as a sixth seed in his latest bracketology. Would you take that right now? I would take it right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would take any single digit seed number you'd throw at me. If you said it was a nine, I'd be like, mm, little, little disappointed, but uh, hoping for like a seven or better, meaning you are clearly the team that should win this game. I'd even take a five, even though the five twelves, the twelves win 50%. I'd take that. Anything. Single digit. Just like to get in. Just like you well, in. not just get I'd in. I want six. single did. I'd take, take a six. Yeah, exactly. In case you missed any of the interviews or trending topics, Deep Blues, all our shows, our BYU sports content is always there for you at BYUSN.com. Up next, who better to talk to about Puka Nakua than Austin Cully, who today we're told has a shirt on. What this season has meant historically and what the Cougars, what Cougars could play in the Super Bowl. This is BYU Sports Nation. 
This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. The greatest wide receiver no, of all no time. No argument for me. It is. <laughs> Austin Cole has arrived live in studio. He got the memo. He Let's got go. the memo. Let's go. This is me. <laughs> that was Halloween and that was Austin Collie. We are uh, we are dressed a little differently on the show today. And so is Austin Collie as we bring him in to talk uh, NFL playoffs, Puka Nakua and much more. Austin, that was awesome, man. One of my favorite uh, appearances on the show ever. No, no shirt, right? No shirt. <laughs> Put on even more weight. Put on even more weight after the holidays. So we're going no shirt. Not, that was, not feeling as confident. That was your choice, not ours. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> Puka Nakua. Breaks the rookie receiving records in yards and catches in the NFL. We, we knew he was a, a special receiver, but oh my gosh, the fact that he actually breaks all these records and has this year. What have you seen from him that has surprised you in any way? And what have you thought of of the greatest season by any rookie receiver in the history of the league. I mean, it's remarkable uh, what Puka's done. And, and the fact that he's been waiting or he's been going throughout the entire season game by game with such consistency of playing at such a high level. Um, you know, uh, I think my rookie year, you know, there, there was there was just waves, right? You catch fire one game and then maybe the next game you're not, you're not nearly as productive. But the fact that he's been able to be so consistent game in and game out is has been unbelievable to watch. He's definitely deserving of the offensive rookie of the year, in my opinion. Uh, the fact that he broke all those records, man, I'm just excited to see what happens in year two. Because typically what happens is they say you get about 20 to 30 percent better from your rookie year to your second year. So I, I can't wait till next season to see what he's going to do. Austin, your rookie year, uh, your quarterback's Peyton Manning. You got Marvin Harrison, one of the greatest of all time, uh, out there as a receiver as well. Puka comes into the Rams. He's got Cooper Cup out there, who was healthy at the time, missed some time during the season, which gave Puka some extra throws, probably. But Matt Stafford's playing very well. How hard is it for a rookie to go into the NFL in that first season and make an impact? How hard was it for you, and how hard is it for for a guy like Puka? I mean, Puka's making it a little easy, a, a lot easier <laughs> than I did, right? Like, I, 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 uh, it, was, it was very difficult, right? There, there's so many factors that you're dealing with. One, you've got to learn the playbook, which, uh, you know, no, no knock on BYU, but, but, but the offensive playbooks in the NFL are, are, are light years ahead, right? There's so many other things that you got to worry about, right? I mean, I, I remember bringing it home for the first time, and, I mean, it was about, like, that thick. And each one of the calls has about three different names that go along with it uh, and different checks, right? So uh, and then you're having to learn protection. I never had to learn that before, right? And I'm sure Puka does, you know, being in the slot so much and having to deal with pressure um, and, 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 you know, running hots and, and et cetera. Like, there's just uh, – I just remember there was a million things going on in my mind. I mean, there were points in time when I would be mid-route still trying to grab you know, out of the out of the, uh, the, the the clouds, what my route was, right? <laughs> um, because there was just so much. So, you know, for me, again, th th that's why there's you know ebbs and flows of games that you're feeling and games that maybe you know th th you didn't have the relationship going, or, or maybe you know a another receiver got on or caught on hot, right? Like we had Reggie, we had Dow, we had Pierre, um, and so. The fact that he, again, I just go back to the fact that he's been able to do his game in and game out is just, is amazing. It is amazing. And, and to be able to do it as a rookie, having to deal with learning a new playbook, I mean, the guy's playing like a 10-year like a vet right now. Puka went on the super comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Crazy. Puka went on the Pat McAfee show and admitted that there are times where he doesn't know exactly what route he's supposed to run as well. And Cooper Cup will just <laughs> tell it to him in the moment, as, almost as it's being snapped, which is uh, very relatable and uh, pretty human, right? Okay, in, in the um, NFL playoff conversation, Puka's in the playoffs. Fred Warner and the Niners certainly a favorite to get back to the Super Bowl. If you're a conspiracy theorist and you see the colors of the logo of the Super Bowl, it looks like Niners-Ravens, if you've heard that one, which is pretty funny. They put out an alternate logo the other day, so people are like, oh, it might be something else. Who, who besides Fred is the most likely Cougar to make the Super Bowl? Oof. Do we got anybody on the Ravens? We got Kyle. Kyle Van Noy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
So I, I, I mean, I, to, to be honest with you, I think the Ra- the Ravens are hard to stop right now. Like, like uh, you know, in, in the NFL, because the season's so long, it's, it's not necessarily the 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 production that's gone on from game one to game two. It's it's how you hit the end of the season with what momentum. And right now, the Ravens are just they're in it. They're in a groove. And what you do not want is you don't want a team as good as the Ravens with as much talent as the Ravens have to start to get that swagger, which is what they've got, right? To start to develop that belief that, hey, every time we touch the field, no one is going to beat us. We will beat any team that you put in front of us because that is, that, that, that is a, that's a hard team to play if they, if they end up having that mindset. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, with the, uh, I'm with the conspiracy, man. I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> and if I, if I remember correctly, I, it's, it, it's going to be the Niners and the Ravens, bro. Like that's, I mean, the Niners are Last a hard team years. to beat. Brock Purdy had, Brock Purdy had his crappy game, right? Y'all, you, you need one of those a year. Brock Purdy was playing way too well not to have one of those a year. He got that out of his system, and now he's getting ready to roll. So, um, Niners are a hard, hard team to beat, pending any, any injury, right? Knock on wood, uh, and, and the Ravens as well. The great Austin Colley with us on BYU Sports Nation. One of the interesting off-season stories here in Provo for BYU and heading into, into camp in, in March is receiver Keanu Hill making the transition to the tight end spot. How do you see that going, and can he make an instant impact uh, at tight end this fall? i got to be honest with you. I, I think it's a fantastic move. right? I think, I think, A, we needed a little bit more depth in the tight end room. I think Keanu is an exceptional talent. Big body, um, you know, training this offseason, just watching him move, man. I mean, he, he's – for how big of a body he has and how he, what good he is, uh, you know, he is in space. I mean, the, the kid's a freak athlete. Uh, I, I only think that's going to be, you know, we all know that uh, uh, the, 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 the athlete uh, or the tight end group, you know, not that athletic of a group, right? I mean, watching Dennis Pitta run around. You know, it's Agreed. a little, uh, a little questionable, a little <laughs> questionable as that as, as what type of athletes are in that room. So uh, I, I think, you know, Keanu's going to go right in there and, and uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, take off, uh, honestly. Uh, uh, again, he, he, he's got a great spatial awareness, which you need as a tight end. He's got a big body. Uh, he, he moves extremely well for how big of a body he is. Um, and I, I, I honestly think that adds a, a, a very unique wrinkle into the BYU offense of what they can do with them. A lot returning in the receiver room, uh, the likes of Cody Epps and Chase Roberts and Keelan Marion and Parker Kingston, perhaps Darius Lasseter if he gets another year. That feels like that's a, a loaded room. What kind of jump do you expect from them? Yeah, I was, I was just talking to Chase and Parker the other day, man. I, I, I'm, I'm really excited about that group. I, I think um, – you know, uh, with with the additions of uh, of, of uh, you know Keelan and the others, um, they, they've leaned out a little bit. As we know, Dom left, but they, but I, I do think the core group of guys, man, just one more year in this offense, especially for those newcomers. Cody getting healthy, um, Parker, you know, he's a true freshman or, or a, a freshman last year. Um, so, uh, you know, for one year each of them all having a, at least a year of experience together um, in this system is only going to pay dividends. Right. And again, you know, having Cody Epps back is going to be huge uh, coming off injury. I know he had a nagging hamstring injury that was bugging him all year, but uh, uh, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to work with them. Uh, I'm excited to see what kind of leap uh, is made. Let's put yourself in the offensive coordinator's seat. Now that the transfer portal shopping season is well underway. Uh, what piece are you looking to add or to uh, for uh, for next season, even if you don't get him for spring, uh, guys are all back in school now. But you can get him for summer and get him into the fall camp. Who are you looking for? I mean, to be honest, we need a QB. I, I think we've said this from the get go. We we need someone that's either going to push Jake um, or 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 replace him. Right? I, I love Jake. I love the way he played. I thought he brought a, a very unique um, dynamic and in, in kind of spark to the BYU offense last year towards the end of the year. He's got great ability to create uh, uh, under pressure uh, and broken plays, um, which is kind of what I think this offense is kind of kind of centered around or relies upon uh, a lot, um, which is maybe what we didn't get with Keaton. But uh, we, we need someone that's going to push Jake, right, that's going to compete, as we said before, you know, as Trevor said before, um, uh, competition 
is is great for the improvement of everybody, right? Um, and you can only get better in an environment of competition. So I, I think, you know, if there's talks of Gary Bohannon coming here, I think that would be a great pickup. Um, but we at least need somebody to push Jake and get him better throughout the summer camps, if not replace him. One of the biggest issues, if not the biggest, was the uh, offensive line. Uh, they've replaced, uh, you know, with T.J. Woods, the new head coach there. What kind of difference do you think he can make, and do you expect that old line to be back to kind of what it was? Yeah, I mean, let's hope it's a lot better than last year, right? Uh, again, this offense relies heavily on the run. I, I think, uh, you know, having L.J. back, um, you know, I, again, being his second year is going to feel a lot more comfortable, uh, be a little bit more decisive. Uh, especially if, if uh, he can trust the guys in front of him. And I think ultimately that's what it's going to come down to is, is uh, you know, building a level of trust for the QB, making him feel comfortable. You know, the last thing you want is a quarterback back there feeling a little bit insecure about uh, his backside um, and, and what type of pressure he's getting uh, and, and being uneasy, right, and feeling like he's always got to escape the pocket. So, uh, you know, I don't know much about Coach Woods, but I have heard nothing but great things. Um, but, you know, I, I think I think the only way up or, or the only way is, is up right at this point from what we saw last year. So, uh, again, it's going to be absolutely crucial to run game. Our offense relies heavily on the run game to get things going, not only on the ground, but in the air as well. Hey, Austin, why don't you turn the heat up in your house? It looks like you're dressed for, <laughs> for the winter storm that's little, not quite here little yet. Little cold, Dave. Little cold. <laughs> little cold, Dave. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for the time, Austin. We appreciate it, and uh, enjoy the NFL playoffs, man. All right, gentlemen. Have a great day. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, man. Austin awesome Collie. Chat. Rise and chat. Let's go. So good to have uh, the former Cougar. Cop pass from like Peyton that. Manning and Tom Brady. Yeah. That, that, that's all his LinkedIn We love say. having him that's, involved with that's us. It. That's BYU it. BYU women's basketball looking for their first Big 12 win of the season. They're on the road tomorrow at Houston. Jason Shepard will have the call at 8 Eastern on BYU Radio. The national championship game in Houston last night. And now the Shep was just a, on Houston. just a day late. Coming up, Top 5 Tuesday looks at the best single season performances by Cougars in the NFL ever. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is a Top 5 Tuesday. Top 5 Tuesday features the best single seasons by a former BYU player, but we're giving you max one year for the player. Otherwise, it would be all Steve Young. Yeah, it would be. Let's start with number five, Ziggy Ansah. What a story mm. Ziggy is. Uh, 47 tackles in 2015, all pro season. 14 and a half sacks. Van Noy's got nine this year, which is Pretty awesome. Good. Ziggy, 14 and a half. Unfortunately, he was playing for the Lions. So we didn't get into the back post when they season. weren't good. Back when they weren't good. Now they're good. good. Number so, four. Ziggy at five. Fred Warner. We're saying this year for Fred. He's had better numbers this year. We think he probably all pro. He's been all pro first team twice. 132 tackles, six TFLs, two and a half sacks, four interceptions, four forced fumbles. He's going to the Pro Bowl, and the Niners are the one seed. Good luck to uh, Fred. Number three, let's go old school with Todd Christensen. Mm. Remember Todd? He, he can run. He can catch. He was also almost pre taysom He just didn't throw. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. He was amazing. 3 12 touchdowns, uh, led the league in what he did best, yeah. and, and, and the Raiders were tough back. Rest in peace, brother. Number yeah. two, we're saying Puka Nakua from this year. How about that? Breaks the rookie record in receptions and yards. Six touchdowns. He's in the playoffs as well. Good luck to Puka and the Rams. Who's number one? Well, pretty obvious here. Steve Young is number one. Of course he is. The MVP. Look at this. Look at his numbers. Incredible. In 94 at 70%. That was ridiculous. And those numbers would be good now, let alone then. Niners chucking it. As a Seahawks fan, a little too much Niners in this list. Yeah, there but, was a lot. They earned their way in. But I agree with the list. <laughs> They're dynamite. Our question of the day. Would men's hoops beating Baylor tonight make up for the Cincinnati loss on Saturday? Our elite voice of the day is presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated. DF Dub uh, Coog on X. Yes, if you lose Cincinnati at home, you've got to go steal one on the road. Doesn't have to be Baylor, but BYU will now need to win a game or two. They weren't expected to win. All right. So and let's see if tonight. BYU can't win tonight. That's tonight. Why let's not? Go. It's Tuesday. Let's go. Why not us? Uh, it's Tuesday. <laughs> No way far, but we got a basketball That's game, what baby. We got. That's what Today's we Today's Rise and Shoutout is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. How about Cougar Nation showing up in Waco? Look at this. There's the fans before practice. Then they went into practice and took a great team photo. Yep. Uh, hey, ever been to Waco in a Big 12 game and, and you see some friendly faces as you get off the bus? 
That's awesome. This is not normal. Teams don't just show up in road towns and have a bunch of fans just waiting for them. That's amazing. That's Cougar Nation right there. Our thanks to today's guests, Austin Colley and Jeff. Conversation continues 24-7 on X, Instagram, and Facebook. This and all our shows are on demand on BYUSN.com. Sorry to Dennis Pitta, we ran out of time. Did I have time for Austin, though? Just saying. For Dave, I'm Jerem. Shout out to Demarcus Harrison. Pre-game coverage of BYU and Baylor men's hoop starts at 8 Eastern on BYU Radio tonight. Go Cougs.